fine. We're here. So, ah, now it says so. Right. So, it's that time of the week again for Views on the News. This is where we get opinionated people to tell us what they think about the weird and wonderful and sometimes horrifying and heinous religious news that's happened in the last seven days. So, let's play the intro. Was the Pope appealing for peace or was he praying for peace? Um, and uh, the same applies to the Cali Moon Dragon. Yeah, that's a good question. So what do you, what do you have to say about that? And please help me welcome this week's panel, which includes Dread Pirate Higgs from British Columbia. How the devil Hi. are you? You okay? Hi. Good, good. We've got uh, a new boy, Aldo, from Chicago. Welcome. How the devil are you, Aldo? Uh, yes, everything's great. I'm glad to be here. Good, good. And welcome to Paul, an, a fellow Englishman. How the devil? Uh, very good, very good. And Guy from a bit further north, but another Englishman. Hello. Yeah. So welcome to all of you. Diving straight in because we've got a lot to take uh, count of, and later on, we may be joined by David. Uh, but David is actually hosting his own Zoom show that I've got to join in with later. So. I'm going to keep this show strictly to 40 minutes, okay? So, as you know, Israel recently had some military successes. They've crushed Hamas and Hezbollah. And in response, 57 Muslim countries sent their foreign ministers to Saudi Arabia to, to decide what to do, how to respond, particularly with re regard to Palestinian refugees. Should these fellow Arab Muslim countries take Palestinian refugees on humanitarian grounds? Well, 46 of them voted politely no. And 11, the other, the remaining of the 57, voted non-politely no king way. <laughs> And um, so I'm going to play you a video. It's rather long, but I think it's worth it. Let me see if I can find it. Uh, yeah, here we are. Four minutes of this. Why aren't more Arab countries in the Middle East taking in Palestinian refugees? The onset of a renewed war between Israel and Hamas has led to fears that millions of Palestinian people living in the Gaza Strip may be forced to become refugees. But despite the fact that Gaza shares a border with Egypt, the Egyptian government almost immediately ruled out any possibility of accepting Palestinian refugees. In fact, Egypt is currently constructing an even larger border wall with Gaza than the one it currently has in place. Now, many outside observers have asked why Egypt, a majority Arab and Islamic nation, would turn away the Palestinian people. People. And of course, many have pointed out that it may serve the political interests of many Arab nations to refuse to accept Palestinian refugees because it allows them to then blame Israel for any sort of humanitarian crisis that unfolds. But the thing is, historically, many Arab nations have accepted Palestinian refugees. And that may be why Egypt doesn't want to now. For example, in 1991, the Kuwaiti government actually expelled nearly 300,000 Palestinians in the aftermath of the first Gulf War. And this represented an astonishing 18% of Kuwait's entire population. So what was the reason? Well, the Palestinian Liberation Organization had actually supported Saddam Hussein's invasion of Kuwait a year earlier. And this support only grew after Iraq began attacking Israel with rockets throughout the war. After Kuwait's liberation, the government considered much of the Palestinian community to be complicit in the Iraqi occupation of their country. And in response, nearly all Palestinians were deported in just a few months. And this wasn't the first time something like this had happened. Decades earlier, the Palestinian groups operating in Jordan had come to openly call for the overthrow of Jordan's monarchy in the aftermath of the Six-Day War. At the time, the PLO maintained its own separate army on Jordanian soil and used that armed force to sow chaos. 
armed gangs of PLO militants drove around the capital of Amman, robbing families and businesses in the name of collecting financial assistance for the ongoing war of attrition against Israel. When members of the Jordanian police and army tried to defend their citizens from these attacks, they were attacked and killed. The Palestinian political network operate as a state within a state, with militants repeatedly using Jordan to launch rockets into Israel. The Marxist-Leninist Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine even went so far as to hijack multiple planes, diverting the flights to a Palestinian-controlled airfield in Jordan where the passengers were held hostage. By September 1970, the Jordanian army had finally had enough. A full-scale war with the PLO broke out, and after 10 months of fighting, the Palestinians were driven out of the country. Yet, as a parting gift, a Palestinian terrorist group known as Black September assassinated the Jordanian prime minister. Sadly, the story doesn't end there, because the PLO then moved into Lebanon, where they allied themselves with Marxist and socialist movements that were seeking to overthrow Lebanon's conservative Maronite Christian government. The presence of thousands of Palestinian militants flooding into the country completely destabilized Lebanon and plunged the entire nation into chaos. Less than four years after the PLO was expelled from Jordan, Lebanon found itself in the middle of one of the most bloody and chaotic civil wars in Middle Eastern history, from which it has never fully recovered. In short, Palestinian organizations have not just attacked Israel. They have sowed unrest in many of the neighboring Arab and Muslim countries as well. And this has led those governments to the conclusion that allowing for mass immigration or even just refugee camp resettlement within their borders would lead to domestic unrest for their own countries. And this, of course, only exacerbates the humanitarian crisis for those Palestinian non-combatants caught in the middle. The problem is, as long as terrorist organizations like Hamas and others are elected to represent the Palestinian people, their plight will most likely continue, as neither Israel nor apparently the surrounding Arab nations want to see their own populations threatened by terrorist groups. So first of all, let's welcome David. Thank you, David. David Hello, New York. New York. Hi. Yeah. Hi. Hey. Hi. But uh, is that oh, David. is that representative that uh, video we've just seen? I, I, mean, I think there's 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 one thing I think it's missed out. Um, I'm, everything you said is correct, but I think the thing it's missing out is that Arab states feel that if they welcome refugees from Gaza, they're collaborating in the ethnic cleansing of Gaza, which they don't want to do. I mean, they they have got other reasons. You know, Hamas is the Islamic Brotherhood, the Muslim Brotherhood which is repressed in Egypt. So they certainly don't want Hamas coming in. But I think all Arab states don't want to enable the ethnic cleansing of Gaza. They take the view that if the refugees ever leave Gaza, they'll never go back. But they're probably it, correct. It, historically, all the Arab nations ethnically cleanse themselves of Jews. Yes. Mm. Yeah. I, I'm not <laughs> defending how the Arabs have treated their Jewish minorities, you know, but <clears throat> there, there is a reason that that video didn't mention. Uh -huh. I, I think that, that is worth mentioning. Well, if the Palestinians and their various organizations are so despicable and such troublemakers wherever they go, why do they attract such sympathy in the West? Mm. Good I question. Yep. Yeah. That's a great question. I, I don't think this can be discussed without going through the to the middle. I, I don't think you can discuss World War II starting in 1943. Uh, I, I think you have to go to the origins because that's where the problem arose and that's where it has to be solved. You have Palestine, which had been part of the Ottoman Empire for centuries, and it lost that area in, in World War at the end of World War One, and it's taken over by the British. The mm. British, <coughs> the British, and excuse me because I know there's some Brits here, but it's just my opinion. Had lost it, it, <coughs> the, the Alpha country, if you will, through the 1800s, but it loses that. Um, they're pretty much bankrupt by 1900. You, you can see by their problems in, in, you know, in in World War One, but much more so in World War Two, which they get into to save Poland from being uh, from an invading dictator, and 
That's how the war ends, with Poland invaded by a dictator. Uh, it, it just didn't have the, the ability to impose its will like it did in centuries before. Yeah, yeah, Which but... Upset you, you, that, what? Am I wrong? You, well, no, but I want to point out that you've taken us back to an origin that was at the early part of last century. And hasn't this really got religious roots going back 2,000 years? At, Where do you at, start? At well, the the religious roots Am I wrong? The Am I wrong uh -huh. or did the Jews leave? It seems, one, I don't think there's any particular group that doesn't like the Jews. Um, they, they have programs. They have, I mean, they're not light. I, I, I don't know why, but but the reality is that they're not. I mean, even, weren't there 12 tribes and they wiped each other out? They don't even like each other. Well, hang on a minute. No, no, now, ten, right? 10 tribes were wiped out by the Assyrians. Oh, by the Assyrians. Wasn't okay. there something, they, and didn't God, like, have a chosen people and say, yeah, but wipe although, out all the other? Although, at this point, I want to ask David what he thinks. He's a Jew. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, in in name, just by um, uh, in name only. Uh, um, uh, well, cultural my feeling is this. Um, I, uh, to your you. point, uh, John. Uh, this is the uh, version of the Hatfield and McCoys fighting each other for thousands of years over yeah. uh, whose God is the greater God. Mm. Uh, both of these, the uh, Jews and Arab tribes um, uh, were Bedouin and living in the Sinai region for thousands of years. And there have been historically times where they got along and historically times where they didn't get along, usually over some form of territory. No one mm. told we're still fighting the same thing now over mm. territory. But... Mm. The underlying nature of this is uh, one where um, it is as as equal about resources as it is uh, hate for one in each other's um, theological constructs. Which yeah, is funny because they're both "quote unquote" Abrahamic traditions. Yes, yes. Except, um, you know, as you find in many religions. Um, my God is the better God. Therefore, yep. you, there, therefore, you don't, you're not human, you know, or well, we can, or at least we can be inhumane to you. Yeah, yeah. The and, point and is, I've seen this for certainly the last hundred years in Israel, Palestine, but certainly the last thousands of years. I mean, you can go back to the Crusades. You can go anywhere and put a pin in it. And find um, uh, pretty much these people uh, um, killing each other with this historical yeah. animosity. Yeah, yeah. So the the point is here, surely, that because they don't, none of them have any evidence for their God. They can imagine that He is what they wish. So right. everybody has a God that agrees with them. Right. What I don't yeah. get is. How come everybody's God is telling them to kill everybody else? That just <laughs> it doesn't right. it doesn't make yeah. sense to me. And I yeah. don't see a solution uh, no. unless you have a, a, a Palestinian state if that gets created. Because right. you have these people wandering around from one place to to how long is that going to go on? Mm. Uh, I mean that that that's the real problem. They don't have a state. A state was created for Israel, but one wasn't created for, you know, like Palestine. Mm, right. And I, th does anybody here really believe that um, Hamas was elected? Democratically, no. Democratically. I mean, was it a real election? Uh, we, we used to say here in the U.S., um, or we send Jimmy Carter to oversee, you know, the election to see if it's valid in it's all right. David's got, got to go and host his own show, and I'll join oh, you later, oh, David. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Thanks, thanks for popping good in. See you again, Dave. Good, good, good to see you again. everybody. Be well. Thank you. Right. Oh I, I God, think we, Hamas originally lost our were Jewish democratically elected. <laughs> they, they were democratically elected, but of course, 
there wouldn't be another democratic election once they got in power. Mm. Um, but the, oh, the so it started as that, a democratic process, but then it stopped. The, yeah. the problem that Fatah had was, number one, they were corrupt, and number two, they were getting nowhere. Their attempts to create a Palestinian state were completely stymied by the Israelis, mm. and they had nothing to offer apart from corruption. Yes, and, and now the rest of the world wants it to be a two-state solution, and neither of them want that. Yeah. yeah. So we're stuffed, basically, aren't we? Yeah. Okay, well, having solved that problem, <laughs> or not I'll move it. on to our next news item, which is about a football coach, a female football coach and refugee advocate who plays for London teams. And she apparently captained Somalia in 2019. And uh, she has always worn tracksuit bottoms rather than shorts because she thinks that shorts would compromise her religious beliefs. Okay, so there she was uh, expecting to play. She's 24 years old, expecting to play her first game on Sunday for the Regent's Park team United Dragons Football Club. And she, she'd been on the bench, but when she, and she was fully warmed up, and she, when she was called to get on the pitch, the referee said, you've got to wear shorts. So, she wasn't allowed to play. Mm. Is there an actual rule saying you have to wear shorts? Or is it just custom? Well, there's a bit of a dispute going on about that. Because she's been wearing these tracksuit bottoms now yeah. for five years. And she says she's been wearing the same tracksuit bottoms. I hope she's washed them in five years. But, <laughs> but, uh, but she says she, she's, if there is a rule, she's been getting away with it. But I think the, the authorities, the Greater London Women's Football League, are now having to look at their regulations and revise them appropriately and let the referees know in future. But what do you think of this? It's a sport. Can, should it be very important what you wear i don't know dread you were first dread well certainly i am in that very same position with respect to uh, government agencies here in british columbia and in canada because uh the passport canada refused to accept my uh, headgear and my my mm. religious headgear in my photo mm. and, it, and it's completely arbitrary it affects no one i mean the only people that would see my driver's license are police if i were speeding yeah. Um, or if I have to show the occasional uh, bureaucrat my ID to get some, some kind of government service. Yeah, yeah. So it means nothing to to have that sort of restriction. It affects nobody yeah. except the person who's being denied the right to yeah. represent their religion as they see fit. If Absolutely. people are allowed to walk around with hijabs and turbans and whatever other kinds of uh, religious gear, uh, that they want to. I mean, people wear crosses on their chest. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, so again, it just, it, it seems completely arbitrary. Um, and again, I'm, that's what I'm fighting for. So yeah, I, mean, I thought, okay. I, well, I thought I, it would I resonate take, with you. I, 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 take I take a was next. Line. Um, I take oh, a similar sorry, line. Wrong person. Um, yeah, because, um, uh, you know, if, if we are going to have an issue, it's over face covering. That's where I would draw the line, mm. uh, not not over what they wear at the rest of their bodies, basically. Yeah. yeah, Paul. Yeah, if you look at men's football, some of them have long sleeves and some of them have short sleeves. Yeah. Mm. yeah. I mean, if if women players have to wear shorts, maybe we should have a rule saying that the men footballers have to either all have long sleeves or all have short sleeves. I, I completely agree. I think she should be allowed to wear long trousers if she wants to. Certainly, and they could be in the club colours, couldn't they, if that's yeah. the problem. Yeah. yeah. Mm. I look for the reason behind everything. If it's a sport, then the clothing should allow you to be mobile, sufficiently mobile to, to perform that sport. And if it's a contact sport, then you need to have uh, 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 equipment, a helmet or pads or whatever. 
if the person feels comfortable, and then the only other purpose of a uniform is to identify one side from the other. If the yeah. person is comfortable, then they can wear a suit of armor. <laughs> yeah. Maybe like telling them what kind of shoes, like, you know, it, uh, you know it, what it brand of be, shoes to wear. Uh, I think we draw the line at a suit of armor. <laughs> That's usually uh, <laughs> in, in a, a contract. Now, I, I have to say... Sport, in a contact sport, a I'll person see. in a suit of armor would have a distinct advantage. <laughs> Dread, I have to disagree with you because the yeah. purpose of the picture is to be able to identify you. So if somebody wears a hijab, I don't know who the hell it is. And if I'm trying to identify people or even know if that's the person in the uh, ID, I need to see their face. So mm. despite their religion being that they can, they have to go to their face and no guy can see it, no male outside their family can see it, for our own security reasons, that's the country. The country yes, says we need to be able to identify who you are. That's why we're taking the picture, and we need yeah. to be able to see your yeah, face. I'm not, I'm not I right. want to yeah. see your hair so I know yeah. that you are dread. Take it off for a second for the purpose that this ID was made yeah. for. But the alternative, if you don't want to do that, is don't get a license, don't drive. <laughs> yeah, I don't, think that, I don't think it's that kind of a dichotomy. Um, like I say, uh, you, you know, Sikhs and other uh, religious denominations are allowed to wear their headgear. Yeah. I should have the same right. By Nobody said you can't wear your headgear. Hang on. If the facial recognition technology takes advantage of this, that's yeah. what they want. Mm. They don't care about that. Mm. They don't care about anything. As long as it captures these data points, that's yeah. what facial recognition does. It doesn't... Mm. Doesn't matter if I have hair or don't have hair, it doesn't care. Right. And yeah. that is a proven that is a proven part of the technology. And the mm. fact that uh, you know Sikhs can wear turbans yeah. is a demonstration of the fact that that is in fact the case. Uh, and I, I, turbans I, are I, nobody I, is I, saying you, you can't Aldo, wear Aldo. the hat. You're wearing the hat Aldo. now and you're in yeah. British Columbia. What they're saying is you can't wear the hat when you take the picture. I know well, yeah, yeah, hit, Sikhs can, you see, that's the point that Dred's that's, making here. That's the point what? I'm making. Yeah, yeah, because it's a religious he headgear, and they're not supposed to take it off, so they can wear the so headgear. Who he has religious headgear? Who decides what's religious headgear? <laughs> he does. On exactly. the nose. <laughs> <laughs> I can have go. a one-man religion and, and wear a blanket over my head. No, no, because your face would be concealed. Anyway, I don't want to spend all the all the news on one item because we've got some other exciting items to discuss. So we, if you want to come back and argue that point, we'll have to put up another show of an hour or something. <laughs> Meanwhile, no, I agree look, with, with, with what Dred is saying that that if, if the sheiks can wear it, he can wear it. Let's yeah, let's yeah. move on. Absolutely. Yeah. So watch this video. This you like this? No, you are in a crisis. You went to the Muslim countries and you imported the garbage that the Muslim countries wanted to put in prison or isolate away from society. You went and you imported them. Why? For cheap labor. But these Islamist extremists, they don't want to work. They want free welfare. They want to marry French women, blonde hair, blue eyes. They don't have time to work. So look at Poland. They don't complain from uh, Islamic extremism, not a single terrorist attack in Poland. The moment they sense there's a problem, they crack down on it. Polish policy, beautiful. The French, no, come. When they come, they use the resources. They go to uh, Washington, D.C., and they sit in Congress. They support the Iranian regime. They go against the sanctions in Congress, right, with their hijab. Why? Because the ideology is filth to begin with. When you import that, or you allow it in, or you amplify it, or you glorify it in any way, you make your bed, sleep in it. That is an Australian Muslim leader who seeks to reform Islam. 
to a more temperate position. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, well, it, there's a growing movement of reform, but um, it's still pretty small, I think. We'll encourage one. Let's encourage it. Mm. Yes. And apostasy. Yeah, yeah, that too. Yes. Yeah. So moving back to the UK, you may remember in July, there was a horrifying incident where three very young girls at a dance class in Southport near Liverpool were stabbed to death. And they've arrested Axel Rudakubana. And since he's been arrested, they've been carrying out an investigation. He, he's in jail at the moment um, in Belmarsh prison. Uh, but they've found another charge to put to him which is that he was preparing for or committing an act of terrorism because they've searched his flat and discovered that he had the equipment to make the toxin ricin um, which i think has been used by the russians in you know their murders of uh, people in other countries and also he had a, a copy of an of an Al Qaeda document that was about um, it was deemed likely to be useful to a, per, a person committing an act of terrorism. So he's now up on a much more serious charge. Um, that's to go with the the three charges Wait, did he of kill murder. Three girls? He killed three girls. One was called BB King. She was six. There was Elsie Dot Stanton. Be a more serious seven. charge. Well, it's, it's yeah. yeah. I mean, it, it's debatable which is the more serious, isn't it? Okay. Yes. Yeah. Yes. But the, inter the, interesting, the interesting thing, Aldo, um, it was that um, uh, in response to these murders, there was a rumor that uh, he was a terrorist, an Islamic terrorist of some sort. Um, but that wasn't um, confirmed at the time. And nevertheless, there were there were riots about it all yes. over the place, not yes. only in Southport. Yes. Um, but now it turns out that he did, did he was in fact some form of terrorist. We, yes. We've yet to learn whether he was uh, Muslim or not. Nobody has said what. Well, Al Qaeda. So we we. <laughs> Even we if don't he know Muslim, that he's a Muslim. He has Al Qaeda. I mean, there, there, there's, there's no evidence of that. Hold yeah, it, that's guys. my understanding. We one don't at, know. One at a time. So, Paul, you you came up first. Yeah, there, there's the police are re releasing information as as they do in dribs and drabs, and the, that's normal for the police to do. We have no evidence to say that he was a Muslim. Uh, it could be he was just some kind of incel or nihilist or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, he was perhaps preparing a much bigger attack. Because ricin was used, I think, by the Aung San cult in the Tokyo Underground some years yes, ago. Yes, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so we don't know his motives. No. no. That's the problem at the moment. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, some things seem evident. Number one, that he's a murderer. And then number two, that he has what has to be a uh, the, the ricin Possession of it can't be legal in England, I, I, it I assume. Uh, and then he has information from a specific group that has a mission. I mean, did he also have to have like a Bible or, you know, or something else? If you're sort of like adding things up about this guy's life yeah. that, mm. that are pointing in one direction. Um, it almost is irrelevant that he's a terrorist because if you killed a six-year-old, I would execute you regardless of whether you're a terrorist or not. I mean, what difference does it make after that point? You already killed somebody. And it doesn't yeah, make yeah. a difference why you killed them. You killed them. I'm going to take you out, and I'm eliminating whatever threat you are, terrorist or not. That's how I would view it. Um, we don't have post hoc we reasoning to tie those two things together. Because he certainly didn't use ricin to kill the yeah. women. That was, you know, whatever his motivations were for that can't be construed as tied directly to al-Qaeda or ricin or wherever the hell else is going on. But, but just... 
it's an irrelevant problem because unless possessing whatever the, the penalty for possessing rice and, and the murder of the three girls is what he's going to be charged with, unless possessing this Al Qaeda information is also a charge. Yeah, it's a charge. It's illegal in Britain to possess it. To possess yes. it. Okay, so he has those three things against him, but he did not commit an act of terrorism. He can't be, in my opinion, convicted of an act of terrorism. Maybe well, the, 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 the charge is described as possession of a document of a kind likely to be useful to a person committing to or preparing an act of terrorism, contrary okay, so to Section enough. 58 of the Terrorism Act 2000. Okay, okay. I'm sorry, I'm not that familiar with British law, but what you're saying makes total sense. If you have this, we're going to consider you a terrorist. Everybody knows it. Yep. Okay, then we're good. That's yeah. on the document. It just doesn't necessarily connect to the murders directly. No, it's a separate charge, but it's yeah. it's it's on the act. You know the um, the the, uh, the law, the statute. Yes, that's yeah. right. Thank you. Anyway, moving on. Um, to America now, where, where some states still do have the capital punishment, which we don't have in the UK. Um, let's go to Pennsylvania, Lancaster County, where there's a quite a large population of Amish. Well, you know, the um, Christian sect that likes to think it's still the 17th century, tr trotting around in horse-drawn buggies and... Um, they don't yeah. use phones, they don't use cars, yeah. they're yeah. sort of... Um, Anachronistic. Yeah. yeah, that's exactly what they are. Yeah. So they're being targeted by the Republicans who want their vote. Now, these, these are people who traditionally do not vote because they separate themselves from mainstream society. So that's what we do in mainstream society is no business of theirs as they see it. Um, so, the, nevertheless, the Republicans are going after them. They've got these huge billboards on the roadside featuring an image of a, a man in a wide-brimmed straw hat. It's commonly worn by the Amish. And the print underneath says, For the Amish, referring to the Amish in their Pennsylvanian German dialect. So... They're, they're wooing them. The Republicans are wooing them. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, my question would be, is that money well spent? I mean, how many Amish are there? Well, in, in, in Pennsylvania, you don't need to spend. You don't well, need many. It's such a swing state. You don't need many to swing it. I suppose. To, to explain America, well, I mean, I imagine that the issue would be the same in in Britain. Um, if you have an election, if you look at the last American election, more people voted for Trump than any other president prior. So you have a lot of Americans, more American than ever, saying, yeah, we want this guy. The, the, our, the good fortune was more people voted for Biden in that election. So we, you're looking at very small differences in, like if you have 50,000 voting for Trump and 50,050 voting for Harris, 51 votes from the Amish doesn't sound like a lot, but it would be enough to, to win. Mm. And I, I can only assume that you are desperate if you're saying, hey, Let's get these people. Let's do this. Let's see if we can resolve the situation this way. Yeah, yeah. Mm. That's the only way I can look at it. Raping the barrel. But if, but if your hope is to convince people who would not normally vote to vote by virtue of a few billboards placed around with with their uh, with their dialect, I don't know. It, it seems I like don't know. Me personally, I and I've studied business. I don't know how I would market the people that never did something before right. and they're not getting something out of it. I'm so, not going to try and sell peanut butter to people who are allergic to peanuts. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think the Jehovah's Witnesses don't vote as well. Am I right? right? Correct, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so um, you would have thought that there'd be more Jehovah's Witnesses out there who might be amenable. From my point of view, what, what's going really wrong here is that these people are 
penalizing themselves by denying democracy due to their religion. Huh? Mm, well, yeah, that's a, a very good point. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, gonna... yeah, you can say that about a lot of religious. Uh, I'm not... I'm not going to jump on them too hard because a third of Americans who are eligible to vote don't vote. So mm. I can't put it on this small minority. Hey, them mm. are the ones who aren't voting. Yeah. In my opinion, Americans, um, every time I hear an American complaint, you know, I feel that's bitching. <laughs> If you mm -hmm. want to do something, vote. But if you are just complaining uh, of the system and not taking any steps to, Australia has it great. They say uh, you pay a penalty if you don't vote. Yeah, That's how mm -hmm. democracy should work. You, yeah, you yeah, want yeah. the advantages of living in democracy. You don't want to do the simple task of once a year yeah. or, or you know whenever going to vote. If you don't vote, you've got no right to complain about the outcome. That, exactly. Exactly. So, so I want to play you an audio now uh, because we've just introduced here in, in England and Wales a an abortion buffer zone. This is a ring around a, an abortion clinic. Yeah. It's, I, I think it's 150 metres or something in which people can't protest against abortion because, you know, they've been terrorising women mm -hmm. seeking an abortion and the health staff providing abortions and, and they've been showing horrifying pictures of um, fetuses and, and stuff and it's not on. So we've just brought out this law and if anybody breaks the buffer zone law they will face an unlimited fine. But I want to play you this um, an encounter, I don't have any video, but this is an encounter with a BBC reporter and a protester just the day before the ban came in. She was asking him how he was going to react. Listen to this. Do you believe in any circumstance in which abortion is okay? Never. If a woman is raped and harmed by a man, yeah. do you believe she can have a baby that she did not consent to having the sex to create? There's an awful lot of women who regret having abortions, including in tragic circumstances of rape or incest. They are dreadful and the perpetrators need to be punished and the woman needs to be protected as well and we need to provide as much compassion we need to weep with her and be empathetic to her and, and show her that well empathy won't pay the bills or deal with the fact that you will be able to see your rapist's face on your baby's face and could be even more re-traumatizing an abortion is traumatic for the woman how do you know that as a man well there's been studies like demonstrate it. You don't need to be of a particular sex to know about the other sex. Will you come when the law changes? Will you still stand outside uh, the 150 metre perimeter being extended uh, from Thursday in England and Wales? I'll see what the policy of, the, of different organisations are and what my uh, supervisors say. He's a sheep. He's going to do what he's do you told. Do in any circumstance in which abortion is okay? Uh, Never. I mean, if a woman is raped Supervisor? Yeah, supervisor. What did he mean by that? <laughs> yeah, sounds as if he's, if he's in some sort of, um, you know, local... A, a, a professional protester? Yeah. He's a, he's a pro-life cultist, isn't he? Yeah. He, oh, some people well, that would be a cult school. if he's getting paid. He's asking his boss, oh, I, I have to check the policy? Yes. Hmm. That's, that's exactly the, that's the, the, that's I mean, crazy, I mean, isn't it? It's, it's a bit of a giveaway, that. Yeah, I, I, I'd be blasting that. There are people whose interests conflict with yours, and they've sent this idiot out to, to protest. Oh, man. Yeah, he, he was beginning to flounder, wasn't he? Mm -hmm. Anyway. Well, if I mean, you don't I believe what you're doing, you're going to flounder. Yeah, yeah. You know, if you we're, don't making progress, it, we're making progress in the right direction, I think. Don't you? Yeah. Mm. Good. There's, well, there's I, been some terrible stories coming out of America, haven't there? Of yeah. women miscarrying and doctors being afraid to treat them. Yes, absolutely. Yes. And the women actually dying because of this. Absolutely. Yes. It, it yes. happened in Texas after they uh, reversed Roe v. Wade, they returned it to the states. Mm. Certain states said no abortions here. 
And mm. then women started dropping like flies. Yeah, yeah. And in one state, I forget which one it is, I think it's one of the um, uh, mid to the to the uh, we, uh, east of the Rust Belt, one of those states there, Michigan or something, um, they, they've had so many bookings from out of the states. Oh, yeah. That they, the local women can't get aborted. Mm -hmm. Because women are fleeing from states where you can't get an abortion to the state yeah. that you can. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, yeah. Finally, and I'm going to slightly overstay my notional deadline for the end of this show. You'll like this, though. It's the humorous one that we try to end on. A group of Texas nuns have been engaged in a year-long dispute with the Catholic Church leadership. And finally, they have been dismissed from religious life and they have reverted to the lay state because their uh, their mother, you know, a, a group of nuns has a mother. It's a mother superior. Yes, that's right. Okay, yeah. And and uh, the previous mother superior um, was the by the name of Teresa Gerlach, and she is the one who was accused by a bishop, um, Bishop Michael Olson, Fort Worth's bishop. Who he, he accused her of having broken her vow, vow of ch chastity with a priest. But, and this is the bit you'll like, she told him she'd never met the priest in person. She was only guilty of sexting. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> surely, surely there are difficulties <laughs> when you're trying to defrock a nun, because surely <laughs> they're entitled to wear a frock Anyway, <laughs> yes. Was, and, was and, there any consequences to the priest to whom she was having this? <laughs> I, doubt thing? I doubt it. Yeah. Um, I, I, you know I, the old joke. What what fun does a monk have on a Saturday night? Go on. None. <laughs> <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I, I want I want to refer to the fact that they. It's appropriate that they reverted to the lay state. <laughs> yeah, get right. <laughs> the get laid status. Get yeah, yeah, exactly. There you go. Okay, guys. Thank you very much. All uh, right. You can develop a habit. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye -bye, guys. Yes. Nice to meet you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Was the Pope appealing for peace or was he praying for peace? Um, and, and the same applies to the Caribbean dragon. Yeah, that's a good question. So what do you, what are you going to have to say about that, guys?